double croissant, which wake up with the king. How did an idea to sell breakfast in 2004 turn into a full-on cultural revolution? Two words, the king. With an outstretched arm, an everlasting creepy smile, and an obsessive passion for 100% flame-grilled beef, the king has been able to take the world by storm without ever saying a word. By showing up in the most unexpected places, like the Super Bowl, late night TV, and even video games, the king completely changed the perception of what a brand mascot is capable of. But the real question is, how did this all start? And more importantly, how did it help the Burger King brand? To find out, we decided to take a trip down memory lane and talk to the people responsible for creating everyone's favorite creepy king. It started with breakfast, well, right, Russ? It started with breakfast. It did. It started with breakfast. Burger King introduces the Battle of the Breakfast. If we were going to go through a renaissance, we had to reimagine our breakfast menu. So the challenge to the breakfast uh, strategy that yielded the king was I needed for this to be unmistakably Burger King breakfast advertising. It was the first. It was the first breakfast brief we had ever gotten from Burger King. The brief was for like this this new breakfast sandwich they were launching. It was for a test market in Ohio. One of the mandates of the brief was that we had to do something that wasn't going to just drive people to McDonald's. It was a pretty big challenge because we had done an analysis, and what we found is the misattribution brand misattribution rate for breakfast was really high. And everyone knew that if you do advertising for breakfast for fast food, people are gonna go to McDonald's. So we thought, oh God, how are we gonna create something where it won't be misattributed? How do we, how do we make it like 100% Burger King? Bob and Mark just sort of went off and did the assignment, came back and Wake Up With The King was one of the ideas. How do you connect you know, Burger King with breakfast? The idea was really simple. It's like, why don't you just wake up with the king, literally. And the idea was to have the king in bed um, waiting um, patiently for someone to wake up because he wanted to give him his new sandwich. And the king hadn't been around for, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years. Burger King had a king person way back when that was kind of like a Ronald McDonald. You know, in a king outfit, he'd blow up balloons and laugh and make kids, you know, giggle and all that stuff. I had no interest in that king. And so when that work came to me, uh, it had a couple things about it that immediately struck me. Number one, uh, a, a man waking up in bed with another man, uh, I, I knew was going to make people's palms sweat, even though the king was not a real man. He was a, you know, this caricature. And we, we didn't want to create any advertising that wasn't based on a source of tension. All of the work we did emanated from a tension-based strategy, and the breakfast uh, strategy was no different. As an idea, strategically, it works really well. Um, I think the second part of it that made it work extremely well, and to this day, is really the, the personality of the king. Because up until that time, a lot of brands, their mascots, their icons, they would keep them behind glass, and they would make sure that they were perfectly either rated G or whatever, and we had fun with the king, and that personality came through, and so we put the king in these different scenarios that it freaked people out, and, and people will say that. We wanted this to be, like, the king had to be the antithesis, the opposite of Ronald McDonald. So when we presented, I do remember when we presented that concept, it came with, like, pages and pages of rules around how you do and don't use the king, and how the king is 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 really important if we're going to do this we have to treat it with the utmost amount of care because it is it's the true representation of your brand and it wasn't that hard of a sell i think we were not thinking because it, it was not presented with a big plastic head it was just presented as wake up with the king and i don't, I don't know if you remember that presentation russ but it was it i was do like okay go because we were making we were in the the mode of of collectively we're saying like, let's just not make one thing in the world. Let's put lots of things in the world at the same time. It was the, the whole office scenario. There was 30 spots we made of that. There was some Serbian chicken and the king was very soon thereafter. So we had multiple things that we were hoping we were gonna hit. They all hit. 
So we presented it for breakfast, and then we were sitting in Alex's office. And one of the concerns that Russ had and the team had, well, and if we have an actor who becomes popular, we're going to be paying this guy a million dollars a year, and he's going to start to get to us. So it was like, was there a way to not be beholden to a, a, an actor years down the line? We didn't know if this was going to be popular. And that's when we were sitting around in Alex's office. And when we first got the business, we had given two interns, you know, $2,000 to say, find everything on eBay. And I remember Bogusky saying, hey, um, I'm going to give you $5,000. Go on eBay and buy every old Burger King thing you can find because we might want to leverage that because Burger King actually didn't have any of that stuff. And so one of the things that um, was purchased was the Burger King head, which was the head that went to a helium tank to blow up balloons at a kid's party. And it was sitting, and we bought it, and it was sitting in Alex's office. So it might have been Alex. I don't know who said it, uh, uh, Keller or Alex, or, but prob probably Alex said, we should use that thing. When the, the king's head came into the picture, I felt like we had found the answer to one of the original questions that we, we asked ourselves. Burger King was a brand that people knew more than loved. And our challenge internally was how do we make Burger King a brand people would love to know more about? How do we re-mystify the brand? How do we surprise people with our guest experience? How do we surprise people with our innovation? It was a, a very strategically conscious sort of a filter that, that I was using when work came to me. And whenever the King's head came in, to the process. I looked at it and I said, this is perfect. He's creepy. Um, he doesn't move. He's kind of like a phantom of the opera, sort of, uh, you know, who, who's behind the mask. And to me, that was the ultimate answer to how do we make people um, think of Burger King as a brand they would love to know more about? Who is this guy? What, you know, and, and so we said yes. We, I mean, it was cool that he was, he was creepy, but he's also very well intentioned. You know, like his, the whole brand is have it your way, and the king always wanted you to have it your way. It's just he had a really awkward method of delivery. You know what I mean? Like he didn't really understand personal space. He, um, you know, he sort of a lot of times he was sort of surprised. You know, he sort of forgot why he, why he was there. Like he'd just be staring at somebody, and then he he sort of raise his finger, like, "Oh yeah, I was here to bring you like a Whopper or whatever it was." We didn't set out for it to be creepy, by the way. You know, like the original plastic-headed king that we had to have it refurb. We were going to just refurbish the one we found on eBay. Well, the the, the great part of this story is that. The lawyers of Burger King said, no, you can't use this head. We don't know whose face this is based off because the records were burned in a fire in the 80s. <laughs> and Bob, if you look historically back at the king, Bob kind of looked like the king. But that is Bob. The king is Bob. I think somebody from account or production came back and said, well, legal said that we have to base this on somebody's face um, or else you know, if we just make a mask, somebody can come back and say that's their likeness and they can sue us. So it needs to be one of you guys. And I just happen to be, I happen to be there, you know. And you kind of look like you have the same sort of features as, as you the face. face. I, admit it, Bob, you got the face. I do have a regal, I have a regal appearance. A lot of people say that. Um, and then, um, so then they, they just sat me on the, on the, um, uh, what is that, the Agora and took a shot, profile shot from the left, profile shot from the right, shot from the front sent it off to Stan Winston, and then like a week or two later, we saw a big plastic head in my face, <laughs> basically. Well, it's funny, because we even have pictures. We had them actually take pictures of themselves, like carving, carving the thing in clay, holding up like Bob's Polaroid or whatever, you know, just to get it just right. Yeah. And it's really creepy when you see a picture of Bob next to the king, and you know it. Yeah, I signed my life away, too. They're like, hey, we need you to sign this thing that you're never going to want any money for your face. Guys, you could have been you could have been so wealthy. I was by like, now. I just want to do good ads, man. Yeah, I'll sign it, whatever. <laughs> we were tasked to build the original king head. Alex had sent some sketches. His inspiration was a was a helium balloon filler, and that's what he wanted to be the character. And then we had Kent Jones sculpt it by hand in clay. These days we would have done it as a 3D model, got all sorts of turnarounds and approval, but in those days, Kent had to take it home over the weekend 
and sculpt it in about two days. So the, the schedule was so tight that we had to basically take it fresh from paint, put it in a box, and then send it to New York. Uh, and I remember that we were all a little nervous. I was probably the most nervous. Is like, if this gets there and something isn't working right, there's no time to react. So at the last minute, we sent Rob Ramsdell, who painted the initial king head. We basically, as an insurance policy, make sure that it arrived so that it could be hand carried, fuming with paint. The TSA today would probably not allow it on a plane. There must be 4,000 pictures out there of TSA agents wearing that head. Whenever I would carry this costume through airports, international airports, I always knew, like you have this giant case that contains the king's head. You're always gonna get stopped by TSA. Every time, TSA will pull you aside and be like, what is in this? And you have to say, well, do you know the Burger King? Everyone knows the Burger King. Literally, you're in Argentina. They're like, the Burger King? They know exactly what you're talking about. Because I literally let every TSA agent play with it because that way you get on the next plane. You know? Rob Ramsdell from Legacy. He, yeah. he, he came in with the head. Uh, and I think it was the first, I saw it the first time a lot of you guys saw it. The head came out of the, the box like it was like Raiders of the Lost Ark, that moment when the light shines up. It was so incredible. And then the costume was so wrong to what was imagined in Mark's head and Alex's head that we knew Alex, I would tell the story that we knew Alex wasn't going to like it. And Mark's like, no, we, we'll just send it. And Alex, of course, didn't like it. And Todd ha finally puts on the costume, and it's the first time we've all seen it. And we look at it, and we're just, I mean, kind of basically horrified, because this thing looks like something you'd buy at, like, Walgreens for, like, a Halloween costume. I mean, it was so bad. And even Todd looked so, <laughs> so deflated in this thing. I think he was really excited that he was going to play it like a king and stuff. And then he looked at this thing, he's like, God, I'm a joke. We're supposed to be having a pre-pro. We're shooting the next morning at seven. And we're just, we look at each other, we're like, we got to fix this. Oh my God, what are we going to do? And again, another fluke, total fortuitousness. Uh, Moxie, New York at that time was uh, right across the street from ABC Carpet, which is a place that sells tons of fabrics. And, and they were open for like another half hour. Luckily, it was like two blocks away and we walk in there and we all grab a cart and we literally just walked through the aisles pouring like fabric. I mean, I remember grabbing like big fluffy rugs for the collar, the like, these velvet drapes for the outside. And they had the, all these rings. I mean, Mark, like we found all these antique rings. So those rings that the king are wearing, they're like thousands of dollars worth of rings that we just grabbed because we were like, we're going to be fired. And we got back and honestly, we just laid it out on the floor. I still have a picture of this. We laid it on the floor and put the head up top. And we're like, actually, this could be the outside. This could be the inside. This could be the collar. And they sewed all night. They literally sewed all night into the next morning. Even by noon on the shoot day, we hadn't shot the second film yet because Tony was still in the basement sewing. I came downstairs looking for Tony, the producer, who was the first time I ever worked with him. So I'm like, Where, what the hell's going on? It's noon. We haven't even shot a, a frame yet. And I go downstairs to the basement of the house in New Jersey, and he's got pins in his mouth when he drops. Oh, sorry. This thing was like barely pieced together. I mean, they were like big stitches. I think there might have even been tape on it, but we got it together, and it actually looked pretty good. And it was so ornate and beautiful. We we couldn't even believe how beautiful it was. And that was, you know, that was a big part of making this character feel extremely real. Um, and have real personality and have real depth. Because I tried to make it as real as possible. I thought he was a real guy, you know, and so not just a, a mascot. So I tried to move my body in a certain way as much as I could and, and, and sound silly, but make eye contact uh, with what I was looking at, even though I'm looking through a mouth, but the king is obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, to be able to play when you don't really know what this thing is, and given the freedom to not just be a prop, you know, which which a lot of times it could be, you know, under different people, under different agencies, even like I that's what I appreciate about you guys is you saw it as you know this isn't this isn't just a prop, you know this is a character and and he's going to be an integral part of the story. It may be a bit creepy, but that's funny. And it and how much can we get away with a pause? How much can we get away with a stare down? Boy, I don't think Todd gets enough credit. You know, you just think it's, oh, it's some guy in a suit, and he was so much more. The mannerisms, the 
the subtleties yeah. of the motions was incredible. And then we shot for like, we literally shot for four hours. That's all it took. And we actually wrapped early. And a star was born. New, the double croissant sandwich. Egg and meat and cheese and meat and cheese. That's right. The double croissant sandwich. Wake up with the king. But the copy in the middle, no one really talks about like, man, we rewrite, that was sort of a signature CPB thing was like, we would rewrite the legal copy on the mini ads, you know, and make them mm -hmm. fun. Like we spent hours and days and revisions on writing the copy, whether it was like meat and cheese and meat and cheese. <laughs> but even once we got into them, like, listen, the food part can't be the worst part. It has to be right. the best part. And you right. got a good job of making sure it not only looked at it, sounded interesting and different and new. So it was in the middle of the spot, but it actually made for it, for, for it, it made it so much more purposeful that it wasn't just a throwaway at the end, which a lot of QSR ads are still. Of course, yes, the hate mail and the homophobic, uh, you know, stuff, uh, you know, came in. I, I have a lifetime of that, guys. I, I, I uh, you know, it do, and by the way, it, it does still cut. It still hurts when I, when people get personal and you know, because I feel things deeply, which I hope is one of my assets and, you know, in, in this business. And uh, um, so you've got to be able to, you know, uh, you know, endure a climate uh, like that. And again, thanks to um, my board, nobody got into my realm and started shaking me up, uh, you know, and saying, what are you doing? And we're getting these letters and so forth. Why? Because the business was responding. And, um, you, you know, know, winning fixes uh, everything, right? Winning fixes yeah. everything. I remember that um, Jay Leno all of a sudden caught wind of this thing and he kept talking about it. And I remember uh, we were watching at one point, he even said, uh, he even said, kill the guys that came up with that because he was so freaked out by it. He literally said that, you know, and he kept talking about it on the show. And then all of a sudden they, they reached out and they said, hey, we want to do these skits with the king. And this was, I mean, nowadays, this would be like brand entertainment. This is something that you pay for as a brand, but this was free. Jay Leno 40 times. Isn't that the Burger King? <laughs> Isn't that the creepy guy? I did not realize. <laughs> you know, Jay asked uh, us to send the King out um, with a crew, and he filmed skits with the King. And again, the people who didn't like the King were uh, outraged that we would uh, allow, <laughs> allow it. But I, I trusted Jay. I was like, yeah, just go out there, film what you want to film. And he was by, you know, he was he was kind of like going along with the whole creepy king thing. He's trying to get in. Yes, he's got a big creepy smile. Yeah! And had fun with it. And I thought it was hysterical. It was always just, that was really what we were about at the agency. It was about developing just bigger ideas and deeper ideas. And as the king's personality started to become bigger and bigger, we wanted to flesh that out in real sorts of ways. I mean, I remember meeting with Brooke Burke, I mean, it was totally insane. Like, we had dinner with Brooke Burke to say that we wanted to see if you'd be willing to date the king. And the fact that she agreed to it, you know, completely blew my mind. We ended up hiring a paparazzi photographer and shooting fake photos of him in LA as if he was a, a, um, a celebrity. Yeah, and Burke. yeah, and, and, and seeding those pictures with, um, I think it was Life and Style and People magazines picked it up. And the magazines didn't really know what to do with it. And they thought, oh, is this an advertising opportunity? And so they would, they, we sent the photos of the king and then they would call, they called Burger King to say, you know, is this, do you guys want to advertise? And they, and they said, why would you say that? We, they just played dumb. And they said, 
why would you say that? Well, we have these pictures of the king. Um, you know, we're curious about them. And I remember we, we were very prepared for this. The rule was you had to say, well, the, the Burger King does not, does not comment on the king's personal life. And they took it very seriously. Do you remember that, Rob? Like, and, and people were very confused. And we ended up, we paid no advertising dollars for those pictures. But I think the first time we started to see like the, um, the, the real traction come was when we did the, um, the NFL spot with the King with the Hail Mary pass. <laughs> That's when the king blew up. That was the moment when everyone decided. Steve, they the loved Steve the Young king. one, though, in the Steve famous run when he runs around and trips into the. Oh uh, yes, that was the one. Yes, that's yes, the, that's the one. Yes, yeah, yes. Really. Just technologically, the way we were able to put the king in that spot, and you really couldn't tell that it wasn't the original. I just thought it was just a technological marvel how we did that, um, and just the response that people had, and they just, um, and just instantaneously loved him. I mean, you don't rarely, rarely do you see that. Oftentimes, you, know, you get a polarizing response. I felt like everyone was commenting on it. It was all positive, but you didn't hear any negative around it. That was probably my favorite King campaign. I like the video games, the, the spots that went with the video games. The yeah. King's pain is your gain. You right? The king's pain is your gain. It was such a good concept, but the games themselves and the, the way the sneak king, they were so, it was so good. That to me was the culmination of like such great marketing and so many creative ideas. I thought then it really had gotten to a cultural level for me. It was like, now if the king's a full Xbox game. But when we got to the Super Bowl, we, Russ was, and all of us were saying, how do we amp this up a bit? And that's when we reshot Brooke Burke as the top of the of the of the uh, the whopper and the king was firing the cannon uh, yes. and threw the kiss to everybody, which gave it a mm -hmm. Super Bowl s kind of, uh, and also completed the romance that the king and Brooke Burke. Yes. Entertainment Tonight played along with it, like, hey, there's a hot romance going on. Yes, yeah, that was one of the other things we had going for us during that six year run is we had almost no turnover internally or at CPB, um, and so people were learning how to really work with one another we were moving at the speed of trust we never feared showing russ something that he would say you guys are out of your mind or you got why are you bringing me this it was such a inviting you know he was tough but it wasn't like you feared showing it not because we were crispin but because russ was russ and there was a culture of like bring me the ideas then we can decide if it's right or wrong don't decide before it was really probably one of the most trusting relationships we've ever had as an agency Part of great brand positioning is, is obviously, you know, to be able to have a very distinctive place in the customer's mind. And we knew with the work we did, uh, the Creepy King just being one example, was work that, would, that McDonald's and Wendy's would never follow us into that area. Russ was just an incredible champion and the trust that he had with us and that we had with him and how hard he was pushing uh, his company and his people to really go for it, that brings in more creatives want to work on that. Creatives want to be a part of that. Yeah, we, we all loved it though. I mean, we were addicted to it. We we're doing great work. And when you're doing great work and you're producing and you see things happening, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. And so we all, we all wanted to work. I mean, it was fun. It was honestly looking back probably the most fun I've ever had in, in this business and there was just so much momentum we just had a great team all the way around from the client to the agency and just the different dynamics within that look we were an agency in Miami um, when we got the account for Burger King you know Donnie Deutsch famously said like first of all who's CPV and why would they even return Burger King's call and that was the sort of thing that just fired us up and we were, we, were fired, we were fired up for a million reasons. You know, it's like advertising was known as Madison Avenue. And here we are in Miami. And what business do we have doing the things that we're doing? So we had a huge chip on our shoulder. And a lot of the work that we were doing was really just to kind of fuck with the industry. And the only way to do something truly unique is to stay focused on the strategy. If you solve the real problem for that brand, that service, that thing, if you actually focus there, you will come up with something that's never been done before. If you just come up with you know, a TV spot for something, it's been done a million times, 
But if you figure out what's the real problem and you look to solve it, you'll make yourself just endlessly useful to your clients and to your uh, agency. Be bold, be brave, everything's an opportunity. I think the king initially started as a very simple, pure idea. I mean, the king's in bed with someone, wake up with a king. There you go, like you can describe it in three seconds. And, and so just getting at the core of the idea that's strategic, a simple idea that's strategic, that makes it, makes it almost like impossible not to buy, right? If it's so strategic and so right for answering the brief, that's where you're gonna sell the best work. Right? You're not going to do something crazy if it's off, even a hair off brief. The only way you're going to do some really great stuff is if this will achieve the goal that you're setting out to do. And so it's really just honing in on what is that strategic objective and what's the best way to bring that to life through an idea that's as creative as you can make it. I think being prolific in this business is, is the trick because you'll get put on every assignment, you know, say yes to all the assignments too. It's like, you never know which one is going to hit this breakfast right. assignment for a test market. Wasn't the sexiest assignment, right? But it forever changed the, 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 the course of the Burger King probably brand, Bob and Mark's career, my career, Andrew's career. Like you think about that little assignment that someone is like, Oh, it's a test market spot for a breakfast sandwich, right? it's easy to dismiss that as not a great opportunity. These guys saw it and said, how do we do the best thing ever? You know, and it turned out to be one of the most famous things in, in advertising history, uh, the King. So that's what I would say. It's like, you know, you, you never know when one of these things is gonna change, you know, right. uh, your, your tra the trajectory of your career, but don't be afraid to, to jump on things. And I, I think the other thing is too, that it's a, uh... Advertising is a team sport, you know? I think that's something we've kind of gone back to a lot here is like there's so many people responsible for that work, you know what I mean? Like like so many people. And I guess to a young person, I would say, you know, put yourself in a position where you're with a group of people who've got a track record of getting stuff like this done, you know what I mean? Like, because I could see... I could see a lot of different agencies having the exact same idea and never making it out of the first meeting or never making it, you know, on to air. To me, I think like, you know, everybody's your friend, accounts your friend, strategies your friend, your creative director's your friend, you know, um, everybody, everybody made that thing happen. Well, I mean, even when I'm pitching jobs now, 16 years later, people bring up the king on call, you know, create young creatives, guys who were 20 who were, were children. They said, oh, the first time I ever laughed out loud at a commercial was wake up the king, you know, and that's when I knew I wanted to be a copywriter or an art director is like, I am really old. You know, if you're lucky once or twice in your career, you get to be part of uh, creating an iconic uh, advertising character. story end? Well, when I left CBB, I told Keller, I'm taking the mask. Welcome back to the studio. That from Rob Riley and Fernando Machado was the last of the Lions shorts films we've been running throughout the week. Lions invited some of the world's leading creative organizations to use the Lions Live platform to share their thinking on the value of creativity and where it's heading from here. No one knows what the future of creativity is really going to be, but the hope of Lions Live this week is that by bringing lots of voices and views together, we may all be able to see a little more clearly.